The following program, The Lightning Strike, is sponsored by Mohammed Fahim and to the extent applicable their guests. The views and opinions expressed therein do not necessarily reflect those of Newsweb Radio Company or its management. Get ready to be jolted out of the ordinary and into a world where conversations are charged with intensity and facts. The Lightning Strike Talk Radio with your host, Mohammed Fahim, broadcasting live from the heart of the city on Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio, WCPT 820 AM. Welcome to a radio show that charges through the airwaves with an electricity like no other. Here's your host, Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, Chicago, and good morning, and welcome to the Lightning Strike, another edition coming up for you today. We've got a very powerful show, and with me in the studios again today is uh, Ken DeLuke. Howdy, folks. And uh, John Arena. How you doing? And I don't, I'm not going to call you uh, John Alfano today, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just, just to set the record straight. And uh, we also have a guest in the show today. Ken, uh, you want to introduce our guest? Uh, Brian or or also Cole. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, my name is Victor. That's Victor, Victor man. <laughs> oh, what am I talking about? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Victor Ganzan. Yeah, well, Victor Ganzan. Right <laughs> uh, so Victor uh, Ganzan is in the studio today, and uh, Brian Orozco is going to be calling in. He's an attorney, and uh, Michelle Alfano will be on the, on the phone with us, and also our person of the week who would be introduced by Sheila White. If Sheila can call in, that would be great. Is going to be Alderman David Moore. So, folks, we got a full set today. Uh, we will be following up with what is happening with uh, Eric's uh, case in uh, the prison in Iowa. And that's where uh, Brian Roscoe is going to be coming in. He's an attorney. He's going to talk about uh, First Amendment rights. Uh, what rights do prisoners have in prison? And uh, that is going to be, a, you know, something that we all need to be aware of. And on that note, uh, let me see. Let me go ahead and welcome our guest and person of the week, uh, Alderman Moore. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? I am very well, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how is the Chicago weather treating you now? Uh, I, I love I love everything that Chicago gives me. The, 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 whether it's rain, <laughs> cold, <laughs> snow, I just appreciate Chicago. And I probably appreciate it even more as you got my brother and friend on your show. Uh, Alderman uh, Arena. <laughs> yep, uh, John has uh, been uh, part of the show for about uh, almost a month now, John. I think more yeah, than a month bit, now. Yeah. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Alderman uh, Arena uh, take you on. We'll see Alderman <laughs> to Alderman how you guys go head to head. John, go ahead. Oh, I've never, I've never challenged. Well, I lose that because he was my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's a pretty good debater. So, well, Alderman, it's it's great to talk to you again. Uh, I know it's been a really busy year for you guys in the city council, and uh, we thought maybe you could kind of give us a sense of what are some of the high points of this last year, and uh, what are you looking forward to in twenty twenty four? Well, uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's do one thing before you do that. Uh, I got uh, Sheila on the line. Sheila, you want to go ahead and say hello to the alderman and introduce him for us. Hello, Alderman. How are you today, this morning? I am doing well. How are you? Excellent, excellent. I'm so excited about the great things that you all are doing, the Alderman, for the Christmas season, for all of the wards, all of the wards for the Christmas season. Um, that puts the ho-ho-ho in Christmas, I'll tell you. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. Yesterday was um, um, awesome, although I wasn't able to make it the Christmas and the wards, which... A lot of people don't know it started 27 years ago in the Inglewood community in the 17th Ward, um, actually under the leadership of Terry Peterson at the time. It was his um, vision, and it was uh, he got with um, Larry Huggins, who's um, you know the, basically the founder of it in terms of you know putting it together. Um, they put it together over 27 years ago, and now has grown. To, I believe it's like close to 38 wards um, throughout the city where they're blessing um, young people um, at Christmas. Well, we just want to commend you for the great work that you're doing in the ward, and that's what this is all about. You are definitely our person of the week um, because of the great things that you're tirelessly working in that ward, doing a lot, a lot of great things. Okay, and uh, John, you want to take it off now? And uh, Alderman, you have a question or, or an answer for John's question. 
Oh, you forgot the yeah, question. <laughs> so, right. No, he talked about the, uh, um, the highlights um, uh, this this year. And first, it, uh, the highlights definitely always, for me, begin with what's happening in my ward. And mm-hmm. as we continue um, to build and develop um, in the 17th Ward, especially uh, along 79th Street, uh, we got two de- uh, two different developments that's going on. That was more than one development on two different sites um, that's about um, 50 to 60 percent complete, and hopefully we'll be breaking ground on that um, sometime in the summer where we got um, over uh, 50, about 52 units of affordable housing as well as um, a, a new sit-down restaurant, um, a small grocery store, a um, play-it-again um um, sports stores, not call paid again, but it's similar to that, and um, and just some, and a um, a youth uh, center called the um, Clio, keeping keep loving each other, uh, which was founded by uh, Tory Barris some years ago when his sister was killed through domestic violence. But he's turned that into a mentoring organization and where he mentors young people. And so as as we keep those things rolling and coming up in the community, um, I'm excited. The other part, and I, I hate. I love to say it, but I hate to say it, and I got to because uh, I, I got to knock on um, wood when I say it. But it, it's important that we highlight it. Um, although we have some challenges um, with crime and everything, I can say that um, it's good to say that shootings are down and it's, and murders in, in the 17th Ward community. I work closely with my sixth, seventh, eighth districts, and mm-hmm. I got to take my head off of them because we work together. Uh, we, we identify those hot spots. And, 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 and they've been excellent. i got to give CPD a, a big shout-out because that's critical. Sometimes people get so used to violence that they don't, they don't even realize that there's a reduction, and it, and it has been a reduction um, in, in definitely shootings and in, um, homicides um, in the 17th Ward community, and I'm excited about that. And we'll continue to work on robberies and, and the carjackings and all of that. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's uh, always been a, a lot of things, especially around Christmas time, about uh, safety and security at the at the magnificent mile now. Uh, any updates on that? There's a lot of concern from local businesses. In fact, uh, a couple of friends that I know had businesses over there, and uh, they are about to to leave town because they just not secure in there. Right. So one of the things that we're we're dealing with, and it's not just on the magnificent mile. It's it's citywide, and 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 a part of this is a situation that's happened. <laughs> that I can just share it in my, in my ward. Um, I think it was on um, Thursday, and I got a call. Uh, the police were in pursuit of a car. They ended up going into a gorgeous development in my ward called the SOS Village. But when you get up in there, you don't realize at the end there's a dead end, and it's just a park. Mm. And the guys that they were chasing ended up running up in there. So they they made a U-turn, and they ended up driving on the sidewalk, knocking down people's mailboxes, destroying um, that grass and everything. What up, why are you looking in that? Because it's the same thing that's happening in my community that's happening um, downtown, and that's this um, pursuit policy, right? Yep. And so the, the, we're not catching them because they had to call off the pursuit. And this is why in the city council that we've been pushing, and it's important that people talk about the crime in L.A. and the crime in New York in comparison to Chicago. But well, L.A. got, uh, if, if, if I remember my numbers correctly, um, over 20-something helicopters, I think. Least, well, let me not be conservative because I don't want to put out the wrong mm-hmm. number. But it was at least 17 helicopters that they that it came out that New York had. And we only have right now um, um, two. Two, right? Um, yeah. And we're and, and we're and we're telling and we're and we're pushing and, and want to put in the budget money for more. And and, and that's where we're gonna we can still pursue these people in a um, diligent manner without causing harm to um, residents while also you know lowering this crime. People don't think they're gonna get caught. They're gonna continue to do the things that they do. That that is that is so correct, and especially uh, with with the new policies in place that you know the catch and release policies that we have going on now, uh, there is uh, absolutely no deterrence for most people to to commit crimes. Uh, Alderman, how do we handle that? When we talk about the the catch and release policy, and we got to be, we have to have judges that are. It's not just catch and release. We have to have judges to be strong enough to say. Man, this is your third time here. This is your, you know, you're not one of these first-timers that we're trying to lock up and you can't get out on bail. 
you know, and, and, and when we talk about the ending of cash bail, which, 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 which I agreed with. But at the end of the day, when you're showing up three and four times, yep. it's up the judges have to make a strong determination because they have that discretion now, and mm. they have to be willing to do that. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, Congressman, thank you. So, I mean, Congressman, yeah, sure. <laughs> Future Congressman. Future Congressman. How about that, David? <laughs> no comment not, on that? He's not running it, Rita. Well, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, he, 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 he mistakenly referred to you as Congressman, but that's that's for another conversation. Uh, well, um, I oh, think okay, it's great. Right. Okay, well, let's, let's, hey, let's, be like, let's be like Mikey. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's great that you, you know, okay. while, while, you know, the crime issues and stuff like that are always uh, on top of mind, I think it's great that you talked about some of the development that's going on in the 17th Ward, because it's unfortunate that the South and West Side gets talked about more of, in terms of crime mm-hmm. and less in terms of the things that are happening, affordable housing, developments that are going on in 79th. And I've been, you know, on the South Side, you know, when I served, I, I got a chance to spend some time down there with David. And there are beautiful neighborhoods. There are Jefferson Parkish and Portage Park like neighborhoods all over this city yep. and, and they get lumped in with the crime stats and it's really about people that live in these neighborhoods. And David's one of the one of the, the aldermen that I always respected because he really works to try to represent his community and, and bring development to a neighborhood that's been overlooked for a long absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Alderman, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, and uh, definitely we'll continue the conversations in the future. And thank you for your time on Sunday mornings. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be back after this with Brian Orozco, uh, Michelle Alfano, and... Uh, We have got a guest in the studio today. Victor Gonzalez is there with us in the studio. And we'll see what we can be discussing about, folks. Do tune in. Uh, The number to call in is 773-763-9278. You are listening to The Lightning Strike. I'm your host, Mohammed Fahim. Your porch is one of the best features of your building. But if your porch isn't up to date with Chicago's latest building codes, you could be facing big fines. Call 773 Porches today to receive a free evaluation of your porch. If your porch received a violation notice or is in need of repair or replacing, call 773 Porches and we will give you a free written quote by one of our trained porch specialists. We provide all plans and permits required to get the job done right. Just dial 773 P O R C H E S or visit us at 773porches.com. Let us take your porch to another level. Call 773 Porches. That's 773 P O R C H E S. Good morning, folks, and welcome back uh, to the Lightning Strike. Uh, You know that we have been following up on what's happening with uh, Eric uh, Strang in the prison in Iowa. Uh, That is not just Eric Strang. It's a lot of other people that have been uh, incarcerated. And instead of uh, uh, coming out reformed, our prison system is actually generating people uh, with PTSDs now. There's, 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 there's no reform out there. And uh, when the people go in, uh, have they lost all their rights? Do they still have the First Amendment rights to speak up? One of the prisoners wanted to uh, get in touch with us and uh, speak uh, about the conditions in the prison. And John, they uh, actually, you know, took that prisoner and put him in the hole for wanting to reach out and and talk to somebody outside. And that is something that should not be done in in our country over here. Uh, Victor, I want to talk to you about uh, some of your experiences. Victor Gonzon is uh, here in the studio with us, folks. Uh, He is, uh, you know, a construction uh, company owner over here in the Chicagoland area, and he is also... uh, gone through some hard times in your life, you were telling me that, uh, you know, if you want to just say a few words about uh, how you got started. Yeah, I got started uh, when I was a young boy. I was about 14 years old, and an old man in the neighborhood decided to ask me if I wanted to do some work for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were kind of tearing up his houses and stuff, and so I made a decision not to hang with the fellas, but to go another route by helping this guy out. Mm -hmm. So after school... You know, high school, every day I would do two or three hours. While I heard the guys play outside and I was working, I knew one day that if I kept doing what I was going to do, that one day they would be working and I would be the guy playing. 
So the, the most important thing uh, that I keep hearing from you, Victor, is that if there's a will, there's a way. And uh, not everybody is really born bad. Sometimes situations happen. Correct. And uh, so with, with Eric Folk, the situation happened a long time back. I mean, and he's been in prison since, what, 2000 and something. Uh, so we'll let uh, Michelle uh, bring in. Uh, Michelle, if you could please give us a quick uh, background on what we are talking about today and why Eric's case is uh, uh, a symptom of the problem in our system. Yes. Good morning, Mohammed. Thank you, as always, for your great vision, for your courage, for discussing these difficult issues. So Eric Strang's case started when he was 19 years old. He was a freshman on the Iowa State campus, and he urinated after a party. And in crime, in, in Iowa, that is a sex offense. It's public indecency, and that began his spiral into the system. He has a 34-year sentence, but he should have been released. We expected him released in the summer of 2022, but uh, a team for the DOC has uh, recommended him for further review, and they're holding him another seven years. And it's I, I, I'm happy that Victor's here because Victor actually is one of the several people who have offered employment to Eric, and um, Victor has submitted three letters of offers of employment that have been submitted multiple times to the prison caseworker, the treatment director, the director of the DOC, the attorney general, the Iowa parole board, and uh, we're talking about a person who has uh, degrees, certifications, Eric has been a model prisoner, but what happens is when he tries to speak, for example, on the lightning strike, when he um, had a phone conversation with you, Mohammed, the punishment became severe. And here's where we enter into First Amendment questions. Well, let's, so uh, Eric said, well, let's uh, bring, was, uh, let's bring uh, Brian in. So, uh, Brian, okay. uh, good morning. If you could... Uh, Quickly introduce yourself. Thank you so much for holding on. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Brian Orozco. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney. I work at a private firm, and we focus uh, cases on violations of constitutional rights for people victims of uh, police brutality and prisoner rights. Okay. So, uh, Brian, let me ask you straight up, man. When someone is incarcerated, do they lose all rights, including the First Amendment rights? What is the situation on that? Um, that's incorrect. Um, everyone in the United States, regardless of whether they're being detained or not, still have constitutional rights. Um, however, um, just a quick background on constitutional law. Um, mm -hmm. You have different levels of scrutiny. When, when someone's alleging that a government entity is violating someone's rights, depending on the status of the individual, you have certain levels of scrutiny. For example, if you try to discriminate based on race with an individual, if a government program has a policy that discriminates based on race, well, that's strict scrutiny. We're going to look very, like, very strongly and very narrow at the government program to ensure that, that that is the only possible way that they can achieve whatever they're trying to achieve without violating that person's rights. Um, issues with gender, that's intermediate scrutiny. Um, okay. And then the rational basis, the lowest one outside of prison, uh, would have issues with age. Uh, you know, if, if someone is trying to apply for a job that, and they're over 50 or 60 years old, then a rational basis test would apply. In prison, it actually has the lowest standard in terms of constitutional rights. So it's even lower than rational basis. So uh, no, for the uh, most Brian, part... Uh, Brian, let me, let me yeah. hold you right there. Now, is there... Uh, does the Constitution support that? I'm sorry? Does the Constitution support that? That uh, um, people, in, people in prison have a different level of rights? The interpretation of the Constitution, unfortunately, by the courts has upheld that. Okay. Um, the Constitution, uh, the only reference to uh, prisoners 
uh, within the Constitution uh, in, in present day the Eighth Amendment, a prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. Okay. Um, but, yeah, the, the courts have interpreted that, you know, based on the fact that, you know, individuals have, you know, violated the law, and because of the security risks within prison, that uh, their rights are a lot harder to uh, protect, unfortunately. Okay. So if a uh, – I, I think Ken has a question over here. Ken, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, um, it's my understanding that uh, one of the uh, rationales that the uh, prison um, – uh, officials are using is the uh, to protect the victims. Well, in um, Eric's case, there pretty much is no victim. So, how do they get away with that? And is there any recourse? Um. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I did a little bit of research on this case, and I and also had a, a long conversation with Michelle Alfano. Uh, that to me sounds ridiculous. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> based on my experience with prisons. Uh, you know, when we file lawsuits, their justifications are, are very broad. I feel like they're very boilerplate. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like they just cut and paste language that they have already saved to respond to grievances uh, or, you know, internal complaints or even in cases like my, in, you know, in cases that I have. So um, I, 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 from what I'm hearing, I don't think they look too deeply into Eric's case or into Eric's situation uh, in terms of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, with the limited information that I have, I believe it's a constitutional violation. Uh, but then again, um, I, I'd have to have a judge affirm that. So going down that road. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have got people from across the country now following what's happening uh, with Eric and, uh, and calling in to the attorney general and the governor's office over there. Uh, there's people, uh, like I said, uh, from uh, from Texas calling in, from California calling in, and a lot of people are listening to us from across the country, Brian. So uh, we are putting the word out. We're putting the word out. We're not going to take this thing lying down in this country, which is supposed to be, uh, you know, equal rights for a lot of us. And if you just look at uh, people who have, uh, you know, uh, screwed with the law, Half of our, you know, uh, elected officials should be in prison. <laughs> Michelle, by the way, uh, do you have, um, Michelle, do you have numbers uh, that people, if they want to reach out, that you can share I with do. the class? I, 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 could, I want, I want, I want to jump in right before that and just uh, uh, help people understand that because Eric tried to exercise his First Amendment freedom of speech. He was tortured and punished severely and still is. He's out of solitary confinement where he did 28 days, but he's in a punishment unit, the level one unit, where men do not receive enough food. They are all extremely hungry. They are not allowed to buy food. That's part mm -hmm. of the punishment. You have three men in a two-man cell, severe overcrowding, the official state of Iowa website in November said that the Iowa prisons are 22% over capacity. So they are putting three men in two men's cells as daily business. That's how they're running the business. And, and when Eric came out of solitary, they, they made these abstract charges, just like what Brian's saying. It's very boilerplate. So they will, for example accuse you of something like false statements or disobeying lawful orders. But then they'll say all the details to this are confidential for the peace and tranquility of the institution. In oh, other yeah. words, oh, yeah. you have to defend yourself on charges that you don't know. Okay, false statements. When were they made? What were they? To whom were they made? Oh, we can't tell you. It's confidential. So... Um, what we're saying is we argue that Eric does have a First Amendment right to speak to you, Mohammed, and the public also has a right to hear what's going on in a treatment center. Newton Correctional is a treatment center. It's designed as the last stop before people get released into the community. And why? Is, is it being allowed by Governor Reynolds, the, the governor of Iowa, that people are being tortured and then they're going to be released and be successful citizens in society? This is unacceptable. Absolutely. So I and, urge uh, people... 
Michelle, Call definitely. Call Governor uh, Reynolds. Yeah, give the numbers <laughs> again, please. Yes. Uh, so get your pens out, please. I urge people to call Governor Kim Reynolds. Her number is 515-281-5211. And, and help us express that these inhumane conditions at Newton Correctional are unacceptable. And by the way, they're being paid for by tax dollars. Another state senator who's following the case is Brad Zahn. Z-A-U-N. His number is 515-276-2025. So those are two phone calls you could make this week to really help us and, and voice opinions that this is not what we want at a treatment center for people coming back to the community. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, folks, if you have any questions, concerns, feel free to call in 773-763-9278 is the number to reach us. You are tuned in to the Lightning Strike on Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio Station, WCPT, 820 AM. You can also watch us live on Facebook.com slash WCPT or Facebook.com slash TLS Chicago for the Lightning Strike Chicago, and you can follow us up on our website, www.tlschicago.com. And uh, Brian, if someone were wanting to reach out to you to uh, retain your services, uh, what's your contact information? Our uh, our law firm is uh, Greg Coolis and Associates, K U L I S, and our direct number uh, is three one two five eight zero eighteen thirty. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Michelle. We'll take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back on the other side. Uh, we'll be talking about the sanctuary city status of Chicago and what is happening in our neighborhoods. Your porch is one of the best features of your building. But if your porch isn't up to date with Chicago's latest building codes, you could be facing big fines. Call 773 Porches today to receive a free evaluation of your porch. If your porch received a violation notice or is in need of repair or replacing, call 773 Porches and we will give you a free written quote by one of our trained porch specialists. We provide all plans and permits required to get the job done right. Just dial 773 P O R C H E S or visit us at 773Porches.com. Let us take your porch to another level. Call 773 Porches. That's 773 P O R C H E S. Good morning, folks, and uh, welcome back to the lightning strike. And uh, the music was going on and on. I was, like, zoomed out over here. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Victor Gonzan in the studio with us today. Victor runs a porch building company. And, Victor, I know that uh, you uh, have offered a job to Eric once he comes out of prison. Uh, what made you decide to do that? Well, you know, I, I know Michelle very well, and she has told me the story about Eric but the thing that impressed me the most is what he's doing to try to get himself out of this problem that he's in. And most people, when they do go to jail, they don't do anything. They just sit around and play cards and eat cookies. But mm -hmm. we got Eric here that's got two degrees. You know, he supports canines and he tutors other inmates. I'm a mentor and I love mentoring people. And when you tutor other inmates, it shows that you got leadership skills in you. And so when I heard that story, I'm like, hey, you know what, Michelle, I got a, I got a spot for him, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and things are hard in business, but there's always a place for a guy like Eric, because you can see he's going to be an asset and not a, not a liability. Well, that that is so important, folks. Uh, some of the uh, people that I have also worked with in the past, uh, ex-offenders who we have help to find employment, they turn out to be the best employees that you can have, uh, especially they are thankful for getting a second chance. And uh, there is an organization out here, Victor, uh, called the Safer Foundation. Yes, I'm very well of it. I used to actually 
I've worked with those guys before. Yeah, so I, yes. I've worked with Safer uh, when mm -hmm. I was working with uh, the Department of Employment Security. Uh, I helped uh, a lot of people uh, go and find employment through Safer. And uh, what what they, every, every year they, they, they do a lunch, uh, an appreciation lunch. And uh, the last lunch that I was at, uh, we were looking at uh, the the room, and someone made a comment that 60% of the people in that room did something wrong, they were just not caught. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Right. So we do things, folks, that does not mean that we are born bad. Okay. If someone can get a chance to somebody uh, to to rekindle their life, why not? And uh, you know, employers like uh, like Victor uh, are a, a definite uh, you know boon to society. Victor, thank you so much uh, for uh, for stepping out to do this, man. So, uh, porches. Let's talk about porches in Chicago. Let's how talk about porches in Chicago. <laughs> how how long have you been building porches? All right. Well, I've been building porches in Chicago since 2003, when I was just a I was just a licensed contractor. And um, in 2003, of course, everyone should know if they're from Chicago mm -hmm. about the porch collapse. Right. Right. That killed uh, 13 people and injured 55 other people on a nice, I think it was a Friday or a Saturday night and yep. on the north side of the city of Chicago. And that's so when I became a porch contractor. <laughs> I was lucky to have an ad in the phone book under porches okay. where we were doing one to two, three porches a year. To getting about 27 porches a month. Wow. Hey, John, um, you're being an alderman. Could you uh, give us a little bit of history on what the aftermath of that uh, porch collapse was? Uh, absolutely. So so I was in office from 2011 to, to 2019, and, and there was a revision to the building codes there. But back in 2003, uh, there was also, you know, at, with this horrific incident, um, uh, one inspections jumped there's uh some of the stats that i have in 2006 there were 6670 porch violations issued uh that's dropped now in 2019 to just over 2000 um a quick question and, is that because they're not doing as many inspections now well, cuz they've fallen off the cliff or is that because all the porches are safe now oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the porch guy is going to say you need to have your porch looked at i mean obviously you know there's there's something north of 1.5 million buildings in chicago and a lot of these were built you know well over 100 years ago i know that you know in the aftermath of that there was a huge push to uh, inspect all of these old porches, uh, get them updated. The codes were increased in terms of this, this the stock. I think it's is it two by uh, ten by tens now that are required. Oh, six by six by six. Six by six now. Yeah, columns, so, yes. Columns. So I mean, some of those kind of core things that help with the structure. I mean, this porch was overbuilt. There was a ten million dollar loss or sixteen million dollar lawsuit uh, against the company that managed the property at the time. But I think, you know, Victor could probably talk more about, um, you know, where are we at today in terms of, one, the number of inspections, the number of porches that have been updated, and, and what do we need to do in terms of building codes in, in, uh, in that regard? Well, my thoughts are, right now, we're at the beginning, we're starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And the reason being, guys, is that the porches that have been recently built in the past 15 to 20 years... There's this thing in the neighborhood is that you just build it and you do nothing to the wood. Mm -hmm. While the weather is now starting to take a toll on all those brand new porches that have been built. Mm -hmm. So now if you go to a porch that's built maybe 10 years ago, you'll see that all the hardware, which is the main part of the porch, has been rotting. Yep. It's uh, fighting. It's called galvanization where the metal is fighting with the wood because of the copper content in the wood. So over the years, they've changed the copper content in the wood and the arsenic in the wood. But, again, nobody is, uh, how could you say, nobody's, nobody's doing anything to their porches. So, again, the, the weather is, I don't even know where we're at with that one. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the weather the weather is just taking a toll again on the porches. Uh, when I got here this morning, okay. I had a few minutes extra. So I just said, you know what, let me just drive down the alley. Let me take a look at the porches down this alley. Well, the first of course, when I made the first turn, the first building that I saw, porch is definitely out of code. 
I'm driving down the alley and I see two or three newer porches. But the problems with the porches is the water just soaks into the wood. Mm -hmm. Then the sun comes out and warps the wood. So, again, we have to go back and do something to all these porches that were recently built. Well, let me ask you, as a, as a homeowner, and maybe this will help inform folks, what, what, how often should people have their, their porches inspected uh, by someone like you that, that knows what to look for and look for the, the, the weak points? Yeah, as a, as a homeowner, I would probably tell you to have your porch inspected maybe every two or three years, but more important, if you're a building owner, mm -hmm. you should have your porch inspected every year, every year, especially if you hired a guy that really doesn't know what he's doing because you based your build on price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The building inspector still may pass the porch, but there can still be deficiencies within that porch. And I see them all the time. So, Victor, uh, why don't we have uh, different kind of building materials for porches? Like uh, for my deck now, I got, uh, you know, that stuff that doesn't rot. The tracks. Composite. Yeah. Yeah, composite. The compo right. composite. So why right. not for porches? Well, we have to understand, first of all, why <laughs> fire exits, and that's what these are, are built of wood. <clears throat> and that's because we're in the Midwest, and mm -hmm. this was a lumber town. Okay. So that's where we get wooden porches from. The reasons why people don't do uh, tracks is it's because of cost. Okay. But we recommend now that after seeing what the porches look like after 10 years being built and nothing done to them, meaning no type of coating on them, is to now that if you have your porch built, have it stained, painted, or sealed, you know, generally three to six months after it's done. Because this now needs to happen to the porches so they can last like they did before. Porches in the city of Chicago were 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. Some are over 100, and they're still in good shape. Okay. They're not in code, but they are in good shape. Why can't these newer porches last that long? Okay, that, uh, that, uh, that begs the question again. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the city of Chicago has a severe shortage of building inspectors also. How does that impact your business? Uh, well, one thing that I do know is generally when a building inspector does come upon a job, the, one of the things he's supposed to look at, look at is a porch. You know, so okay. generally what happens on that one is if they look at the porch and write the porch up, then they do. If they don't, they don't. There are ways of finding out, you know, how many violations of porches are getting per week by going on the City of Chicago website and looking under porch violations. Okay. Right. So, again, you know, I, I know they're short on inspectors, but... You know, they, they really do need to just keep on these porches. They really have to. Well, because it's a question of life and death, uh, especially, uh, you know, when we have people gathering and porches falling down. And it's uh, very important, folks. So pay attention to, to your porches. And uh, let's take a quick break again and uh, come back on the other side and talk about the sanctuary city status of what is happening in Chicago and why we had a... A, a tent going up in a place that was uh, so heavily polluted that they had to pull out of there and after spending like a million dollars and now the contractor says oh, I'm, I'm going to eat that million dollars so obviously there's some hanky panky going on folks when a contractor can eat a million dollars while building a sanctuary tent city and still come out ahead we'll be right back 773-763-9278 is the number to call in Your porch is one of the best features of your building. But if your porch isn't up to date with Chicago's latest building codes, you could be facing big fines. Call 773 Porches today to receive a free evaluation of your porch. If your porch received a violation notice or is in need of repair or replacing, call 773 Porches and we will give you a free written quote by one of our trained porch specialists. We provide all plans and permits required to get the job done right. Just dial 773 PORCHES or visit us at 773Porches.com. Let us take your porch to another level. Call 773 Porches. That's 773 PORCHES. 
Hey folks, did you know there's a program in Illinois that if you qualify for it, would allow you to get solar installed in your home at no out-of-pocket cost? The benefit to you would be a reduction of your electric bill, possibly as high as 30 to 50 percent, and more importantly, you would take out the uncertainty of almost guaranteed future price increases imposed from your electric company. If you'd like to see if you can qualify for this program, call Ken DeLuke at 312-617-8979. That's 312-617-8979. Help us save the environment and change that electric bill burden. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Folks, uh, good morning, folks, and welcome back to the Lightning Strike. Uh, in the studio with me today again, uh, Ken DeLuke, uh, Victor Gonzan, and uh, John Arena, and of course our intern, Tidy Pipkins. Tidy, thank you so much for showing up, man. And uh, we got a caller on the line, uh, so let's see what uh, our caller has to say. Again, the number to call in 773-763-9278. Go ahead. Good morning. You're on the air. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Uh, my mm-hmm. name is Lou. Um, I actually had a porch built um, a couple of years ago. I had it sealed, and um, I'm just wondering, like, what Victor would recommend as the cadence for um, uh, to basically preserve the health of my deck. Okay, so you had a porch build a couple of years back, and uh, what would you recommend, uh, Victor, for the health of the porch? Okay, well, did you have your Correct. porch sealed, stained, or painted? Uh, I had it sealed. Um, I used the Thompson water seal or something equivalent to that. Well, you know what, Thompson Water Seal, guys, is great for wooden porches. That's the minimum work that you should do to a porch, and that lasts a couple of years. And I would recommend, sir, that every couple of years you power rinse your porch. Don't power wash, power rinse, because hmm. power washing and over-power washing your porch will deteriorate your wood. So you want to power rinse your porch with a light chemical and then reseal it with Thompson's Water Sealer. If you don't want to do it every year as a building owner, you can have, of course, call our company, 1773porches.com, and we can give you an estimate on staining or painting the porch. But generally, an apartment building, we would tell you to paint it. Okay. Because it's uh, just it's done, it's over with, and you don't have to wor- worry about 10, 15 years. And we're going to be sending a bill to Thompson's Water Seal for advertising <laughs> their, their, their name over here. Thank you so much for your call. And, uh, John, let's come back to uh, Thanks, Sanctuary sir. Cities. we got a few minutes. Uh, let's talk about what's happening. Sure. So uh, there was an attempt to put a referendum uh, <laughs> on the ballot uh coming up and just got a little background the city council every election cycle the the city itself can put three up to three questions on the ballot um usually in my experience those were softball questions that weren't seeking to kind of get you know too much information because in my case we had tried to get uh, in 2012 we tried to get a referendum question about the elected school board uh, that was blocked because Daly, or I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Emanuel didn't want to have that conversation with the with the voters, so it was pushed out for some question about why is the sky blue, something like that. Okay. So these questions usually aren't very substantive unless it's an agenda item for the city. In this case, uh, the a few aldermen, uh, including Anthony Beal from the Ninth Ward and Forty uh, First Ward Alderman Napolitano. were trying to get a question on the, the ballot about Sanctuary City. <laughs> Um, because they're trying to equate Sanctuary City with the migrant crisis that's going on. And, it, and the problem is those two things have nothing to do with each other. Okay. And uh, so, so to get kind of into some of the meat of it, the, there's about 18,500 migrants that have been sent to Chicago who, from the, the southern border who are here legally. They are asking for asylum. That is a legal process. Okay. So this is not anything to do with the Sanctuary City Ordinance, or it's also referred to as the Welcome City Ordinance. Okay. What that does, and it was started, Harold Washington first issued it in uh, an executive order in 1985 because the federal government was asking the city and to report anybody to ICE um, uh, that they suspected were not here legally. Okay. So this um, was was put forward by Washington. It was uh, it was reaffirmed by Daly in in uh, 1989. Um, it's been updated over the years a couple of times in 2006 and again in 2012. But the core of that question has to do with 
whether we work with the, uh, the federal immigration services as a city okay. to report people who maybe are suspected of not being here legally. And and that is the sole uh, you know authority of the of the welcome in city slash sanctuary city ordinance. So you see it has nothing to do with the migrant crisis and we know okay. in politics sometimes it's all about what's the appearance mm -hmm. and and as opposed to what's the substance. I'm glad you brought that up because myself up until today I didn't even realize that because I figured sanctuary city means they can always come in you know as as the immigrant uh, crisis uh, continues but uh, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, it's they're they're two different issues and and they're both, you know, they're both very important issues but for different reasons. And ultimately again the the, the question isn't on the ballot because it's not a legitimate question, right? If you okay. if you take away the sanctuary city uh, ordinance today, it would change nothing about dealing with the migrants that are being uh, brought here. The city is taking some action against the bus companies who are coming up here and just kind of dumping people out onto our streets, and it creates it's a it's a, more of a C dot issue because it's uh, dealing with uh, transportation, and you're just putting people out onto the street who have no familiarity with the city, and you're trying and the city is trying to manage this process. So they are taking some steps to try to coordinate better with these incoming uh, folks who are again here legally seeking asylum. Okay, so folks, that that is the the big difference that we are looking at over here. Okay, uh, I know that a lot of people are are trying to you know gaslight this issue, saying oh so many, you know illegals are coming in. It's not illegals coming in, right? Yeah, in in terms of the, the bus, people do cross the border illegally, of course, of course yeah. and that's a whole different issue. And and there's a ton of money that the federal government puts towards uh, trying to control that and trying to you know, uh, make sure those people are, you know, taken out of the city or, or whatever. There's a there's a whole federal process for that. We have to kind of be discreet. These are people who are, you know, have gone through some horrific situations in their country. They're fleeing war. They're fleeing persecution, whether it's religious, whether it's political. And that's what the asylum process is for. So when we it really doesn't help when political figures try to use this as an opportunity for political gain and vilify these people when we need to be having a conversation about how do we treat them like human beings <clears throat> that are approaching the, the border, that are coming in through approved uh, ports, mm -hmm. and, and, and then they're being you know, set up as political pawns by a governor in, in Texas and then put on a bus without a knowledge, in many cases, they don't even know. Yeah, they don't even know where they're to. going. Yep. Yeah. And uh, folks, here's here's the situation. Okay. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to call in. You know, uh, share your concerns with us. It's uh, okay to to call in and and talk about issues and talk it out instead of uh, holding it in. The number to call in seven seven three seven six three nine two seven eight. We got a few minutes before we finish off the show today. Uh, but following up on what we have been doing with Eric Strang and other people who are imprisoned and the kind of impact that it has on their families. When someone goes to prison, it is not just that one person who is uh, in prison, their entire family life is disturbed, folks. Uh, we are going to uh, have a, a quick uh, meeting next week, uh, Wednesday. We are having a, a Zoom discussion with some of the families of people who have been incarcerated. So look for that. Uh, we'll be posting that on our website. We are creating a podcast section on our website so we can discuss issues in more detail than what we can on a one-hour talk show over here with a few minutes on each topic. So important topics like what is happening with Eric and other topics, we will be having more detailed discussions in a podcast format also. So you can go to tlschicago.com forward slash podcast to listen to more details on our podcast coming up. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com slash TLS Chicago. We are creating that platform also for you. and We want to keep this show listener supported. We don't want to take corporate advertising on over here so that people can tell us what to talk about and what not to talk about. This show is for you 
Like I keep on saying, it's of the people, for the people, by the people. And we need you to come in and, and support the show in any way, sh shape and form that you can so that we can bring out these issues and talk about what is happening in our country that we need to come up with some solutions for. It's not just problems, uh, John. There, there, are, there are solutions to every problem. Yeah. Hey, uh, Mohammed, um, you sent something to me last night which kind of blew me away, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> you, you wrote a poem that has uh, a lot of bearing with like the Eric Strand story, and if it's not too much of a burden, could you share that with the class? Well, I, I brought a copy with me because you had asked me to, and uh, this is when I was setting up uh, the Zoom at uh, midnight, past midnight, uh, I just could not sleep. And uh, I was uh, setting up the Zoom uh, conference uh, for the families. And uh, so the, the thoughts started coming in. And I will quickly recite it. Uh, in shadows cast by prison walls, families bear the weight of heavy falls. A tale unfold, a silent scream of lives entangled in a broken dream. Behind cold bars, a loved one dwells, a tale of sorrow the heartache tells. Innocence lost, freedom confined, yet a ripple effect through hearts entwined. A child yearns for a father's embrace, a mother's strength, a tender grace. The echoes of laughter, now distant and thin, love behind bars, the struggle to begin. In the dance of steel where hope is confined, families carry burdens, the ties that bind. The bread earner absent, a vacuum profound, economic shackles, poverty unbound. A silent trial the children endure, the stigma, the judgment, the world obscure. Yet in their eyes a resilience shines, Love's beacon, a light that forever twines. Oh, the loss of income, a bitter string. Yet it's love and affection that truly swing through hardship and pain. They rise above in the face of adversity, a testament of love. Innocent hearts in a relentless storm, striving to keep the family warm. For crimes uncommitted, they bear the weight, yet Love's defiance is their potent trait. And now with Christmas coming up, folks, while the world celebrates the Savior's birth, in these families there is a Savior's dearth. There are no happy holidays to celebrate, only a despondent, bleak future to deliberate. The thoughts just came, folks, and I started uh, typing them out and sending it to Ken and um, the folks who are going to be joining us for the family session on Zoom. Do tune in, listen to the time, uh, you know, to the Lightning Strike podcast every Sunday mornings. And uh, we'll be with you on next Sunday on the 24th also, uh, Christmas Day, no, Christmas Eve. Uh, feel free to join us. And again, thank you so much for listening today. And uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, uh, John. And thank you, Tyree, for coming in. And Victor, thank you for being our guest in the studio today. Thank you, you're welcome. And by the way, that was amazing. I'm just saying. Awesome, right? Awesome. Thank you, Ken. The preceding program, The Lightning Strike, was sponsored by Mohammed Fahim and to the extent applicable, their guests. The views and opinions expressed there.